Hello and welcome today to another episode here at the War of the Rebellion podcast for Age of War. I'm your host, Niels Eichhorn. And today, I'm really looking forward to this episode. This is going to be a lot of interesting material to talk about. I have with me today, Shannon Eves from South Carolina, Charleston, College of Charleston to be precise. She's a graduate of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And ooh, her new book came also out from the University of North Carolina Press, which is quite a coincidence, right? <laughs> her book is entitled Sexual Violence and American Slavery, The Making of a Rape Culture in the, Amer in the Antebellum South. Came out in April of 2024, and it's it's quite a book. It is quite a book to read. Quite some interesting stories in there. Um, but I want to start and ask you, Shannon how how did you come to write a book about this? What what kind of drew you to this subject matter? Well, first off, I want to start out by thanking you for for having me, and I'm really looking forward to having this conversation with you today. Uh, you know, there, I've been asked this question before, and and I realized that there's actually uh, a few things, a few things that brought me to this book, um, and many of which are are quite personal. Um, the you know, uh, on the most personal level, you know, I I grew up, you know, hearing the the origin story. You talked about the origin of the book, and so I think about the origin story of my family. And I grew up hearing the origin story of my family, um, being that there was a formerly enslaved woman named um, Sarah Hutto who in South Carolina. Um, ended up having two children in the 1870s um, by a man named Montgomery Eves. And these, you know, and and her son, she had a son, um, her first child was a son um, named Joseph Cyrus Eves. And Joseph Cyrus Eves was my father's grandfather. And so it, I, you know, I tell this story even in my class to my students and they're like, your dad's grandfather was, but you know, <laughs> cause I, there's not that many generations removed, but mm -hmm. um, you know, this is, this is because my Joseph Cyrus Eves had a son named Lemuel Eves um, who was born in 1894 and he had my father when he was 60. So, you know, that's, you know, so my, right. that's why there's yeah. not that many. So, th so this is not a very far removed history, right. you know, yeah. um, from it's very me. personal. Yeah. Yeah. Very personal. And, and, and it's, and so, you know, she, at the time in the 1870s, she worked as their housekeeper and, but had been previously enslaved by this, by this family and, and continued to labor for them as a housekeeper in the immediate aftermath of the civil war and, you know, had these two children of mixed race. And, and so, yeah, knowing that this was my great grandfather who then had my grandfather who had my father, I, you know, I was always interested about this, di this dynamic um, about interracial sex and with, but with sp specifically within the context of enslavement mm -hmm. and, you know, going to college and reading more about slavery than I had ever done in my K through 12 education. And, you know, that's when I began, you know, reading Frederick Douglass and reading people like um, Harriet Jacobs, Incidents mm -hmm. in the Life of a Slave Girl. I gained an even greater understanding of how prevalent the sexual exploitation of enslaved women, you know, was. And so, the, you know, that's, you know, those, those testimonies, mm 
as well as my family's own history are really what led me to want to explore this topic. And, you know, I, I realized that I had really only scratched the surface, you know, with even, with even that understanding. And so, you know, with time, and as I read more and more testimony and it led me to, to, to understand that this is not the, the sexual exploitation of enslaved women is not just a, a history that, or even a circumstance that had an impact on enslaved women that, that enslaved men had an, had an experience that mattered and that was important, that there were implications for slaveholders as well. And this is what, you know, made me begin to think about violence as like a, a, a tool of power mm-hmm. and how it shapes how people interact with one another. It shapes how they understand and position themselves in relationship to other people. And all of those things are the makings of culture. Mm-hmm you know, people's expectations of one another, how we are supposed to move and navigate. And, and so, you know, this is how I, you know, went from just having a, an understanding of enslaved women's vulnerabilities, but understanding that this is really about a larger Mm -hmm. cultural power structure that had an impact on everybody who lived within this space. Yeah, no, it's 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 fascinating when you think of like I mean the the sort of unsaid parts in your book, right? The parts that you kind of leave to the reader to kind of make the connections themselves of like like what what then happens in like the Jim Crow era or even in modern times, right? It's it's it, it's very fascinating to kind of think and sort of that like extra extrapolate from your book onwards, and that that was something that. I found extremely fascinating about it as well, because it's sort of like, like, where do all these things like in the late, right? In like late 19th century of like, ooh, we have like all these lynchings of black men because they looked the wrong way at a white woman, but then the other way around, a white mob attacks a black woman and nothing happens, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's, it's that culture that you kind of breed in during during enslavement and then it becomes a cultural norm in the south and mm-hmm. it's, it, again it's fascinating that that again that some of the unsaid parts that i found really intriguing about your book <clears throat> now it's, I, I really want to first tackle a little bit the kind of challenge with regard to sources because you already mentioned jacobs and um, douglas but we're all obviously looking here at people that are in, intentionally silenced, right? For the enslaved population. And but how do you get to their voices? How do you how do you bring out stories that even today people don't want to often talk about because they're so traumatic to them? How do we get to those stories? It's such a good question, and it's and it's a question that you know I. You know, I definitely utilized various, you know, methodologies and strategies to be able to, you know, tell the stories that I do tell. But I think that your question also, you know, begs us to also consider, you know, the when it comes to things, when it comes to sexual violence, you know, the delicacy, um, you know, how delicate we have to be when we think about telling these stories and, 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 and think, and and even questioning ourselves about whether or not we, we should always tell these, you know, whether we Mm -hmm. should tell these stories, how, how should we tell these stories? You know, there's, there's a, there's really a need to be, you know, very ethical, you know, so as, so, not only I think as a historian do we have, or did I have the challenge of the silences in the archive, the the fact that the enslaved people were, 
you know, systematically silenced and denied often opportunities to write and communicate their experiences. Um, but there's also the ethics of, you know, do we as, you know, practitioners in the 21st century, you know, how how much do we speak about things that people found in their mo in their own moment in time to be unspeakable? Mm -hmm. You know, do you know, do we do we write about what might have been the worst day in someone's life, you know, and, and mm -hmm. what sort of care, what sort of care do we bring to that? And so I, I appreciate your question because it gives me an, op it gives me an opportunity to, I guess, you know, share with whoever's listening, you know, the, 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 ch the broad range of challenges that we face, you know, that the, the challenges are not just in the, what you know what we as historians would label the lack of sources mm -hmm. right but there's also the challenge of once you do find a source you know how do you yeah. you know how how do you handle that source how do you handle that that person you know how do you show respect and honor you know to to that person and so um you know those are it, it's it's there's, there's, there was a lot to think about and, um, you know, but to answer the, the question about the part about the, the sources that I used, you know, I, I did find a lot of useful information in enslaved people's testimonies in, you know, the, in, in the few that we have, you know, we have the published, we have published, uh, slave narratives, where in, in form, mostly formerly enslaved people are, you know, writing their memoirs, they're writing autobiographies, talking about their experiences. And, you know, it only takes reading a few of these to understand how prevalent uh, sexual violence is in these narratives. And, you know, there, there are people who over the years have said, oh, well, that's because this was propaganda and they're being you know, they wanted to be provocative and salacious. And, you know, I would argue that, no, they were talking about the things that they knew to be true. Mm -hmm. They were, they talked, it, it, it came up in so many of their narratives because so many of them had, if not firsthand experience with this, you know, very, you know, these were things that they witnessed. These were things that they heard about. These were cautionary tales that they were that they were told. They were told to be on guard about this. They were they were told about the how horrific this was, and that you know to me that's that's those were the signals to me that this is not propaganda they're speaking about a, a a culture they're they're speaking about their cultural understandings they're giving voice to the fact that their parents and their family members were hyper vigilant mm -hmm. about this thing because they understood that you know as an enslaved girl or enslaved woman it mattered you know how you maneuvered space it mattered where you know whether you found yourself alone in a particular place at it or at a particular time um so you know these sources were just so invaluable to me i i also used other um enslaved testimonies the wpa narratives after the you know before the civil war was over and even immediately after we have other government agencies who are interviewing mm -hmm. you know enslaved and formerly enslaved people and are documenting um their voices and so you know I, I started out with most of my research you know collecting testimony from enslaved people mm -hmm. and um and then that's what then started to lead me to ask other questions uh, particularly about enslavers. And so mm -hmm. then I went and searched for their documents. 
And, um, and so, but I'm, I'm very, you know, for so long, you know, we've had to often get at enslaved people's experiences through the documents of the people who enslaved them. Um, but I am, I am very, you know, pleased that I, you know, was able to rely on so many, so many sources that were produced by enslaved people themselves or that captured enslaved people's voices, you know, even from, you know, government records as well. You know, I found, you know, court documents where enslaved people's voices and their experiences were documented. And, um, you know, so I was able to, you know, extrapolate a lot from those. Well, it's, it's a very broad base and uh, you have to sometimes be creative and, and, where you look yeah. for sayings, right? Yeah. I, I, I'm very glad you brought up because it, it is a very personal, personal moment that you're going to talk about for all of the individuals that you have in your book. And it's it makes it that, that much harder, right? Of like, would I feel comfortable with a historian in 100 years talking about our most in, intimate moment or the... Mm -hmm most traumatic moment and it's mm -hmm. it is a hard choice on our part of like did they want us to tell this yeah yeah uh, it's yeah. yeah it's 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 true and um and some people you know and even from the records i you know i see the ways in which right. some people you know were willing to be explicit mm -hmm. in testimony yeah. And there's people who talk about it more subtly, mm -hmm. you know? So, I mean, that's, you know, that's where we are clued into the fact that every, everyone is individual and they all and everybody handled, you know, trauma and responded to it differently. And, um, and so, yeah, there, there, there are so many questions and, you know, that we as the historian, as historians, you know, have to ask of our ask ourselves um about the people that we write about and um you know you mentioned earlier about silences and i think that any you know doing any sort of work on slavery you you have to you're forced to think about the silences and and sometimes speculate and 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 offer you know what might this person have thought in response to this particular action or this particular thing that, you know, this person did. And, and so, you know, that is kind of one of the ways in which you can, that you flesh out, you know, the sources that you do have. And, and, and sometimes it's just about having the reader, you know, sit in the silence and, and let, you know, let them, you know, let, let your, let your audience, you know, do a little bit of that as well, because, there's some things that we just can't know. There's, you know, there's some things that we can't know. And sometimes we do have to sit in the, un, in the discomfort of the, the things that are unspeakable. One, one other aspect that sort of, as we're talking about so that really stands out is sort of, because you you you're saying when you look at these sources, like so many people are mentioning it, and would it be too far a stretch to say that rape, sexual violence, sexual assault are an average common experience at any plantation in the South? You know, I I would definitely say that it was a freak, you know, a frequent mm -hmm. experience, and at the very least, something that um, that people would have been fearful of the possibility. Mm -hmm. You know, and and so much of this is because you know, and and one of the things that I that I talk about in the book is that I I de I define you know I I use the term rape cult rape culture, mm -hmm. but I'm also very explicit in defining sexual exploitation very broadly. Mm -hmm. That 
that we're talking about sexual harassment, we're talking about sexual coercion, we're talking about reproductive exploitation. So even even and and this would be something that would be that would be prevalent on any plantation because all slaveholders were invested in their enslaved population reproducing itself through re, you know sexual reproduction i mean when we if if we if we think about the 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 economics of slavery and we think about like capitalism and 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 slavery like this is a part you know the this you have production right like producing uh, your enslaved labor force is baked into the plantation system and so in that regard you all enslaved people were mandated to couple and to have sexual relations and if you were resistant to that then you know you you would be forced to do that and there you know there's lots of testimony of enslaved people you know being you know given the opportunity to so, you know select you know their partners but they were still selecting partners under this mandate mm -hmm. and their partner could be sold at any time and then they would be mandated to find someone new mm -hmm. if a partnership proved to not be fruitful and didn't result in, you know, a pregnancy and, you know, slave owners were motivated to force people to couple with other people, you know, so when we think about sexual assault, I mean, that's in, in that's in and of itself, like, of, of um, it's sexual assault in and of itself to force people to, to have sexual relations with one another, you know, in, with the expectation that, you know, they would produce children. And so, you know, just that alone was a part of all enslaved people's mm -hmm. experience. And it was definitely an expectation. And, you know, and if you, and, you know, people talk about, they testified to, you know, the questions that they would, the pressures that they would get about, mm -hmm. you know, coupling being getting married and finding uh, a sexual partner and and getting and then it didn't end then it became about are you pregnant and you know when's the next baby coming along right you know this is this constant expectation that you will have a child every year every year and a half and i mean throughout the course of your you know the course of your um you know your reproductive life and and so yeah those those stressors were a part I, I would say that I think it's fair to say that that was a universal you know experience and you know even if you had a slave owner or if your slave owner you know had sons who you know didn't necessarily you know you know, make the choice to, you know, go to the slave cabins at night. You know, there, there were so many, there were so many other ways in which you could be vulnerable. Maybe it was an overseer. Uh, maybe it's slave patrollers who were doing their rounds at night. You know, all of these people who the system of slavery gave power to, mm -hmm. You know, all of these people, you know, took advantage of that power and 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 many of them had the opportunity to tap into uh to sexual violence as a form of power over enslaved people. And so yeah, you this so it's so again, even if you know, even if it's not, even if you weren't born on a plantation where your owner has a reputation of behaving in this way you you have no idea of the new overseer that they hire because the last one died or quit you know you don't know what that energy in that in the in the behavior in the 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 propensities that that person is going to bring you don't know 
who the patrollers who are riding down the roads on their horses, you don't know what decisions they're going to make. And so I would say in that regard, you know, everybody had an understanding that they could be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. If you were sent in town on an errand, so maybe your plantation is a place where you don't necessarily feel that, but you're entering into a new space where you don't know if you're going to be harassed or coerced or dragged into an alley. You know, there's um, so this, you know, this is the this is the culture part about it. This is the rape culture part about it. Right. That you're vulnerable in different ways mm-hmm. and, and in and by at the hands of different people across different spaces. Well, there's things that, like, as you were talking, part of it was all, all of a sudden going back to, like, Southern culture today still, right? Of, like, you have a 25-year-old unmarried woman in the South. People are like, why, why, aren't, why aren't you married yet? Why don't you have, why haven't you kids yet? Or you you finally get married, and it's like, oh, when is the first kid coming to you, right? And, like, it, it just, like, sh- just shut up. <laughs> none of your business people but um, it, it is sort of like that weird expectation that still is with us right I'm like we you, you gotta reproduce yeah and it's you know it's a it's a diff it's a it's a different type of culture but yeah. at, like, what you're getting at are the the elements that make up a culture mm-hmm. right the um And so I think it's, you know, that sort of culture, you know, is definitely more gendered, right? Like Mm -hmm. the, um, the, the expectations that like oftentimes, you know, women still find themselves, you know, under that, even if they choose to become professional, right? There's still this expectation that they'll become a mother and like, Mm -hmm. then what does that mean if you choose not to? And, you know, and and what sort of societal forces are going Mm -hmm. to judge your choices and you know how if you do decide to be a professional and a mother what are the implications of that on your job right you know these are um you know you know different culture but still you know still a a, a cultural a a set of cultural expectations Mm -hmm. and that that have an impact and 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 create create heaviness in in a burden and and um and can shape and can shape people's you know shape people's lives and um and and sometimes cause them to make decisions that maybe they would not have otherwise made you know to evade you know though you know those sorts of questions or to meet people's expectations or to avoid consequences mm-hmm. of not meeting those expectations and so yeah i mean culture is it's it's very brutal yeah it's very yeah i mean yeah cultural cultural expectations are there there's so many of them Mm -hmm. (laughs) there and you know but at the but at the root you know they're they and they will they have power Mm -hmm. yeah yeah exactly and it that actually is the exact lead over I wanted to go to <laughs> questions of power, right? Because you you do you do have an interesting section on sort of the notion of um being a concubine, concubinage that you're talking about. But we're also talking about the plantation where the female slave is property, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like within that power dynamic do you really you you don't really have the ability to say no to these advances without suffering potentially dramatic consequences so there isn't really like anything consensual in this yeah it's it's the you know the these questions of you know consent versus coercion you know these are you know, historiographically, you know, these are things that, you know, historians have been chewing on um, for so long. And I, but I think, you know, for me, where, 
what I thought it was really important for me to consider is to number one, absolutely first foreground the power dynamic that existed between any slaveholder and an enslaved person. And so we we know that, you know, within that, this is a person who by law can can kill you with impunity. You know, I mean that's that's a that's a form of power that's undeniable, right? Um but within but I think it's but I felt like it was also important to think about how enslaved women navigated that that power dynamic how they what sort of decisions did they make and I think that when we think about when we think about power power is you know is something that it's it it's 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 shifting it ebbs and flows even if you know even if by default one person has you know more more power it i don't think that it necessarily means that you know the other individual doesn't have the ability to you know make make particular decisions or to craft responses to the circumstances that they face of course they do that understanding the that you know the implications that there are potential consequences that this person then has a particular amount of power to respond to the you know to the the move that you attempt to make you know in response to the move that they made right so it's you know i i i wanted to think about you know, just, you know, this, the, this, think about space and how people oh. negotiate. Um, because, you know, even with, even when there are power dynamics, there's all, there's always, you know, ne negotiations mm -hmm. being made because for every action, there's a reaction. Right. And so I look at when I think about enslaved women who, you know, who are, who find who have either you know been coerced or well it seems like, like what you're you know what, be, what, yeah being like women who are who find themselves in these long-term yeah. you know long-term you know sexual liaisons with slave owners and and you know the 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 way in which those long-term liaisons looked you know they looked very different for different women you know some women found themselves you know, being, you know, being housekeepers and essentially, you know, being charged with managing an entire household and, mm -hmm. and sharing a bed every night with the man who owns them and, you know, being in a household where they have multiple children. And, you know, so it, it looked very different, mm -hmm. but I think what's, I think for me, what was really interesting is to think about what these, what these enslaved women did and what decisions did they make? What decisions did they think that they can make? What sort of leverage did they think they could wield? Did they, that they, what sort of leverage did they think they could have in those, in those circumstances? And, and what I find is that, you know, there are women who are not, who, who aren't, who do take as much advantage as they can mm -hmm. of the, the the creases in the power dynamic that's there in the they they take advantage of the space sometimes mm -hmm. these real that these sexual relationships um afford them um but i but i also find that you know there's times where their efforts, you know, aren't six su aren't successful, you know, and they try they try new things and and they try different things. And I and I just I think that just speaks to the the human condition, you know, that that people when they are trapped or captured, 
oppressed, you know, they're always going to find a way to try to improve, to try to better their circumstance, to try to make things better for their, their children, to try to make things better um, for their family. And it, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't mean though that, you know, they weren't faced with something, you know, really terrible. You know, I think that there's often been this impulse to try to talk about the privileges of, of, of concubinage and, and, and there, and there were enslaved people who understood and even defined certain things as privileges, you know, talking about how sometimes these women wore better clothes. Sometimes they had access to food they had access to their own cabins. Wow. But I think that there's there's space to think about how having your own cabin might seem like a privilege, but having your own cabin also means that there's an absence of witnesses mm -hmm. when, you know, that having your own cabin also creates unlimited access, you yeah. know, without any witnesses for this land. It makes, yeah, there's a vulnerability right. also in having your own cabin because you haven't been given your own cabin just out of benevolence, yes. right? Like you, you have this cabin because now it creates a space where this person can come in and, you know, assault you or, mm -hmm. you know, or have sexual relations with you whenever they want with, you know, without any sort of um, impediment and, and so, yeah, you know, it's, it's just, it's tricky. It's, it's tricky when we, mm -hmm. we think about the, I mean, cause I think what's important to, I think what concu, what, what I call, you know, sexual servitude, what I think it brings to light is that two things can be true that, that someone might have a, the might have better food or they might have better clothes, but they, they might also have different vulnerabilities mm -hmm. you know they might also um you know face a a different a, their own different set of mm -hmm. challenges um and but one of the things that i write about are the measures the the things that these women that some of these women the things that they do try to do in light of to improve their situation mm -hmm. So, you know, I, you know, cases where, you know, these women are petitioning to, you know, for their freedom, for the freedom of their children, because their children are the, the you know, are fathered by their slave owners. Times where these women are trying to inherit land because, you know, they've made cases that, well, this man intended to give me this land or, you know, he wrote this in his will. And though his family is is now contesting that will, this is why I should, you know, this is why to the court, why I should get um, this property. And and so, you know, that those were the kind of interesting questions um, that, you know, there were women who were willing to seize on um you know, anything that could be perceived as a benefit or, you know, a, a the result of their connections to these men in this way. Yeah, I think the, the, the case you're kind of having there is that case in Georgia where it's like that, however we want to define her and she is supposed to get her freedom and then the family goes against it and it's like... <laughs> Uh, it, in many cases, very tragic how these things things go. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, and when and in in her instance, I mean, when we think about this is and this is why I think it is always important to think about power mm -hmm. because because you know in that instance, this man in Georgia, he had he had plenty of opportunities to free this woman so if he wanted to. He had even been he had even been advised by his attorney to just to yeah. take her to a free state and free her. Yeah. And he chose not to. Yeah. And 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 that's because he, you know, he benefited from his ownership of her. Right. You know, yeah. he didn't want to, he didn't want to do that. He didn't want to free her because in freeing her, 
maybe that would mean that she would never deal with him again. Right. right. I mean, so right. he, he wanted to be able to continue to maintain that level of control and power over her. And in doing so, he left her future in the hands of his family members who he left behind. Right. Who and didn't care. Who didn't care, who had no investment in her or the child that they had together, right? So she fell on those people's mercy to honor his honor his will and and they didn't. They, you know, they didn't, they didn't want to. And and so, you know, that's the, you know, these are these are the circumstances that these that these women we're navigating knowing mm -hmm. that this man does you know he's promised you his your freedom but and he has a pathway to even provide it to you right now mm -hmm. right but he's okay. choosing not to why you know and and I, and I think that yeah i mean i think ultimately you know i think that these women were they very much understood mm -hmm. why you know i don't think that they ever lost sight of the fact that at the end of the day, they were somebody's property. Their children were someone's property. Um, and it, it it's sort of like the, the other part that I found really fascinating with your book was some of the like, okay, some of the stuff that you have in the book is like just stomach <laughs> turning. Uh, we'll, we'll maybe get to one of them in, in a bit. But I really found the the story of Robert Hamilton that you have in there really fascinating because he's like writing to that love interest of his and it's like hey I know and I would really like you to be my wife but he's like and he, he's so inexplicit right you're kind of like what are you talking about what <laughs> what is it that you're like what kinky weird stuff are you into <laughs> that you, you all of a sudden are and then it's like this whole marriage is sort of falling apart of his because he continues to have sexual relationships with his enslaved women. And it's it it felt like this doubly showed the this power relationship, right? Of like, you have the, the enslaved woman who can't really do anything, and you have the wife who also is sort of at the mercy of like, well, either accept it because I told you or like try and get a divorce, I suppose. So it's just like, there's so much power that these um, enslavers, slaveholders have in, in both directions within their family here. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, Robert Hamilton, when I found that letter, I just, it just, because like you said, there's so much nuance and, you know, he uses a lot of euphemism, but then he's also really explicit in some uh -huh. ways. And, and I, and for me, what I found most interesting about it is that what he's really doing for, to me, what I saw him doing was laying out the, laying out the, the terms and conditions of their marriage uh -huh. that making saying, this is what I'm going to do. And if you don't like it, ultimately that's going to be your problem. Right. Uh -huh. That, you know, he's because, you know, what we have to, you know, earlier you mentioned something about this uh, or getting at kind of like, um, is this a secret, you know, like interracial uh -huh. sex being a secret. And I, and I would say that like, Either, you know, that people talked about it at the time, like as it being kind of secretive, but, you know, if it was a secret, this was the biggest open secret. Yeah. In, the all, terribly of, in, in, in all of the biggest open secret in all of history. Right. Uh, you know, that it, it's like, like all one had to do was just look around the enslaved population to just see the presence of people. Yeah of enslaved people of mixed race. I mean, there's just yeah. no denying that these men are having sexual relations with enslaved women who are giving birth to these children. And like, I mean, there's, it just, yeah. 
was the biggest open secret. And so you we're talking about a landscape where, you know, interracial sex was taboo. It was labeled as taboo. Right. It could be scandalized, but there was also a lot of forgiveness and there was also a lot of leeway that these men were given as long as they were discreet, as mm-hmm. long as they did not, as long as they did not create scandal for their family. And in the whole like labeling of it, of the whole taboo thing really, I think was more so for to me, I kind of see it as like a pressure valve, like Mm -hmm. being able to gossip about it or being able to like, you know, kind of cut your eyes at someone was just a, was particularly a useful tool for, you know, mothers and daughters to be able to like, you know, deal with, deal with this thing that they, that they knew that they didn't have any sort of power to prevent or to stop, you know? So, you know, the taboo, I mean, it's something that was labeled taboo, but it happened with such frequency and, and, and well, really. Well, taboo if you were a white woman. Right. It, yeah, right. exactly. It, but it's, it's like, it's, it's labeled as taboo for white men to do this, but it's, it's also so permissive that it's a privilege, it's a privilege of their mastery Mm -hmm. and they, they do it in many ways unashamedly, but Mm -hmm. because there was a, there were some lines, you know, Mm -hmm. there, there were, there were presumably, you know, ways in which to go about doing it. So there were, there were ways in which you could go beyond the pale. If Mm -hmm. again, if you, brought scandal to your family in any sort of way if it became if it became like you know an issue and it ruined your reputation like that that's where the line was was drawn right and so what you know what he's saying what what his letter really reveals to me is that what he's saying is okay if any of those things happen then if I do cross the line or if I do, or, or if you find yourself not being able to deal with it at the end of the day, it's, that's going to be, it's, it's not my fault. This is, it's about, yeah. it's about absolution. And so one of the arguments that I'm, that I'm making in that chapter about, you know, about these men is that they, they have an expectation that that if that if that if they engage in this behavior in ways that is upsetting to their family members or even society that you know it's not that they can there are these certain tropes that they can rely on to escape any consequences right this is oh you know this has nothing to do with my character this is just my sinful nature and you know like god forgives sin you have to forgive sin there's the trope of the hypersexual mm-hmm. um, you know, black woman that, you know, this again, wasn't my fault. This woman, you know, she seduced me and, you know, it, my actions get explained away by that. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's this, it's the, it's this language that they use where they're, they, they, they build into this system, all of these tropes that they can rely on to explain away their behavior once it gets to a point where it starts to create tension within their own households. And so what Robert is saying, I don't even want to begin to think about the things that Robert is interested in Uh sexually, Uh because, Uh you know, he himself describes them as like, kind of deplorable and peculiar eccentricities and like, you know, uses all of these Mm -hmm. euphemisms and, and does say that, you know, his, his needs could be fulfilled by his wife. Right. He tells her before they get married, like there is a world we can live in where you could fulfill my needs. But I, but I know that because he also understands you know, he also understands um, these notions of like of white women's virtue and how mm-hmm. important white, you know, the virtue of white women is to is, you know, how what role that plays in this society and that, 
Um, he's expected to protect white women's virtue. These women themselves are expected to protect their virtue. So there's things that, you know, that they're, that they're not necessarily supposed to do. Right. And, and so he, but he does tell her, you have a choice. Like there are things you could do, but I know that you're not. And so just know that I'm going to get these needs met elsewhere and elsewhere. And, and, and who's the, Mm. who is the, you know, for him, the, the perfect outlet for these things. It's, it's enslaved women who he knows that he can wield unlimited control over. He can force them to do, you know, his peculiar eccentricities Mm. as he, as he calls them. And, but I think what's really interesting though, is the message that he tells his wife that, um, you know, your choices are to either do them your do these things for me yourself or turn a blind eye and either way i'm to bear no responsibility and and so this this is how the this is how these you know for me this is you know th- this is the the cultural landscape mm-hmm. of that you know, that white women are navigating as well, right? You know, these are the choices, these are the the the, the circumstances that they're being presented um, with. So that's, you know, that's why this book is, you know, it it's talking about the experiences of enslaved women and enslaved women are always at the heart of the story, but it's talking about how the implications and the consequences for enslaved men as well, but also the implications and the consequences for for white women and 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 how these things trickle into their homes right. and have an impact on on their di- on the dynamics yeah. within their marriages right um and i mean it's almost like this guy literally put a sign up it is like serial cheater please marry me right like <laughs> yeah good and god and you know and the thing that's really strange though is that <laughs> the the there were many courts that would not have if his you know his wife does we we find out about this because his wife files for divorce and all uh-huh. of this ends up in their divorce papers but there were many courts who and judges and legislators you know who were the ones at the time responsible for granting divorces or not who would not have even yeah categorized or characterized i should say a man's sexual relations with enslaved women like as infidelity mm-hmm. you know like that would not have you know or or grounds for divorce mm-hmm. even you know white men were more often granted divorces for interracial sex or charges of interracial sex against their wives than the other way around. Mm -hmm. And most of the time those men were successful because their wives gave birth to, you know, a child of mixed race. And so they could point to that as evidence. And, um, but, you know, it was really hard for these women to get the courts to take that, you know, to take charges of sex with enslaved women as a legitimate reason, you know, to get a divorce. But I think that, you know, she, she's, I think, you know, she's making the, she's using this letter obviously as a very powerful testimony of, of, I guess, you know, what she sees to be the depths of the depths of his, of his, um, of his character flaws that, you know, that she sees Mm -hmm. that she's trying to make the case. Deprivation was my word choice there. um, Almost. Yeah. yeah. Which actually I, I I kind of hate to stay on the same chapter because this, this, wow, that was just a crazy chapter, chapter four of yours. (laughs) Um, Because after Hamilton, you have James Henry Hammond's story and the parts there was sort of like where's there no boundaries right because you you have the story of Hammond like having sexual relationship with the slave of his wife right that was Sally and then he continues on with Sally's daughter who's 12 
which is like I get it that at this time women were married off very early sometimes, but twelve seems like that's still a kid. Yeah, I mean, it, and I think there's ways in, you know, this is a society where, you know, you know, women could be married as, you know, as early as like 14 or 15. But I think that, yeah, even, you know, even with their sensibilities, 12 would still very much be seen as a child, yeah. you know, and, um, and, you know, Hammond... Hammond's story is such an interesting one because, you know, I think it's fair to say that this man, you know, he was depraved in in so many ways. Mm -hmm. And yet his story speaks to the society at large because mm -hmm. though, for example, he he molests you know sexually you know is is sexually inappropriate at the very least it's fair to say with four of his nieces and so you know these are young white women in a society you know they they were the children of wade hampton this is one of the wealthiest families not only in south carolina but in the entire south yeah. these are women who would have been considered to be some of the most eligible Mm -hmm. you know, marriage age, you know, girls and women of their time. And because uh, the fact that his molestation of them gets out, they, you know, they're never, they never get married. I mean, they're essentially mm -hmm. ruined by him. You know, mm -hmm. they're in this society where women are expected to be chaste, you know, until marriage. I mean, their, their lives are ruined as a result of him. And yet he is still elected to, you know, public office even after that. Even after that, he becomes, you know, as the senator from, from South Carolina in the United States Congress. Mm -hmm. And the situation yeah. with, and so I, and so, you know, he's able to survive that. It's like, if he's able to survive that, then you know he's able to survive the, what's the travesty of him sexually assaulting this mother and daughter at the same mm -hmm. time, having children by both of them at the same time. And not only is, and, and, but I think, you know, I, I talked earlier about how there were certain lines and for his wife, you know, who had lots of reasons to be disgusted by him because the, the mm -hmm. four the four nieces that he molested were her nieces. They were her sister's children. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, but she does end up leaving him for several years over his sexual relations with this mother and daughter, the, this enslaved mother and daughter. And he writes in his journals about, you know, again, he's relying on many of these saying he can't, he can't understand why his wife is not able to just understand and forgive his his flawed nature, right? You know, he's he's not willing to take responsibility for any of for any of this. And he places the burden on her really to to forgive him, to absolve him. And um, and I, I think their story is really interesting because, you know, most women are not leaving you know when they learn these things you know she's a she was a you know a woman of privilege who came from a very wealthy slave owning family herself so you know she had another plantation to you know es escape to and and to try to force his hand to make a different decision but mm -hmm. you know his journal his journals that he kept and he kept very detailed journals he he's very explicit that she does leave him because he because she finds out that he's and has given him an ultimatum to stop having sexual relations with this with this child essentially and but he but he doesn't and um in addition to the fact that he doesn't his son also at some point in time ends up engaging in sexual relations with this mother and daughter as well.
So, you know, this is learn this is behavior that's that's taught. It's mm-hmm. it's learned and, and and he writes his son, he writes his son a letter saying that, you know, such you know, Sally and and her daughter have children, and you know, he he has to throw in there a line of deniable plausibility. You know, he's like, well, you know, there's, they're likely neither of our children, but, you know, at the same time, there's also a possibility that they are. And, you know, and, and so, you know, he's like, and they need to be provided for. And so, Mm. and, you know, and so he does, you know, he is, he does tell his son that he, that, that, in his death, I guess that there should be some provisions oh. made for the children of these two women because they have been fathered by them, and and so yeah, I mean it. In the fact that even after all of that, and after the fact that you know his reputation does his de- reputation does take a hit. He does have to take a step away from politics. You know, he had previously mm-hmm. been the governor of South Carolina. Um, he, you know, wants to be a senator now and, you know, Wade Hampton, who was his in-law, who was the father of these four girls, you know, he does his best to, I mean, he wants to kill him actually, but, you know, he that would does have been interesting. Yeah. He does his best to ruffle up his rep, his public yeah. reputation and, um, and, you know, his wife leaves him and, you know, that's kind of being talked about and that's creating scandal, um, but even after that, yeah. you know, he still ends up getting elected. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, again, it just, it speaks it's to culture, the, norm- right? the normalcy, yeah. Yeah. the normalcy of this, the, the fact that even though people might scoff, might gossip at the end of the day, this is not something that would prevent somebody from becoming being elected <laughs> to be one right. of you know amongst yeah. the most powerful people yeah. in in the country and and I, and I think that it speaks to the how explicitly sexual s- sexual power how ex- mm-hmm. how explicitly you know sexual power was um was recognized and utilized that 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 sexual violence was understood to be a form of power that one could could utilize in this society to be successful to be wealthy mm-hmm. to be to be powerful and 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 that was that was normalized mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and it's, it, yeah, it, it, it definitely, it tells you a lot about this time period. And I think it also provides a lot of, um, it provides a lot of understanding of, you know, even the world we live in, the world we live in today, you know, I mean, we, it's you know we see instances of politicians and celebrities and musicians and you know media moguls you know who it, it we find out later that for decades you know they sexually assaulted people and 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 got away with it right because in some ways they, you know, they were, they were, they were utilizing their power to gain sexual access to those people and to also silence them from, you know, utilizing their positions and the things that they had to, to silence the people from, from reporting those things. And so, you know, we still, we still live in a, in a society where, you know, you know, that being, you know, committing sexual violence not only doesn't um, exclude someone from being in powerful positions, but that, but that being sexually violent 
in some ways is how people secure secure their their positions mm -hmm. of of power in in our society. Yeah, and uh, and that actually kind of <clears throat> want to draw slowly to the end here. Um, one of the things that kind of I want to see what your opinion is because you wrote the book about it. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And it, it first crossed my mind when I um, read Diane Summer Wills's Raven Race in the 19th century South, because it was it was such a fascinating book of her looking at these court cases of like, it was not just like black on white or white on black, but it was it was all kinds of these sexual assault cases that she looked at in 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 Virginia predominantly, right? So, and I thought it was a fascinating book. Um, in the same way that I think your book is fascinating because it has sort of all these different power dynamics, like challenges that we need to think about even in our in our own time, right? Of like like we earlier where you talked, I was saying like, yeah, like how often have we heard these stories of prosecutors being like, oh, she was drunk, it's her own fault, or she wasn't wearing the right clothing, that's her own fault, or God, God knows what people come up with as excuses of why rape is the victim's fault, right? And one thing that I always like, I, I, as I said, I find it fascinating. I think it's a great topic, but I, I shied away from using it in class. And mm -hmm. the reason why was that the culture in the country is still so predominantly thinking in these like, oh, it's her fault terminologies that I wasn't sure if the students would be able to kind of move beyond that, um, that they would maybe, maybe fall back on that trope and be like, well, you know, why, why should I care? Uh, yeah. So, well, I guess first question in that is, do you teach any of these materials in your class and how do you communicate that to your students? How do you deal with this kind of, complexity yeah i you know i i do teach it and and one of the and i find that one of the most effective ways for me to teach about rape culture during the antebellum period is to talk about rape culture in the present mm -hmm. and and to and, and you know rape culture is obviously a very is a contemporary you know it's like a 20th century 21st you know century term and i'm you know i'm i'm applying it to the past people in the past weren't using that sort of terminology but it's a framework mm -hmm. that so adequately describes for to me at least what was happening during this time period and I, and i draw i make the arguments for my students that that rape culture as we see it today is a continuation mm -hmm. That, you know, that and to understand that our country was established on the the sexual exploitation of of black women at the, mm -hmm. at, the ver at the very least, how fundamental um, the institution of slavery was to the, the the founding of the economy and and how even our legal system you know, was crafted on the, on the, the need to, uh, you know, our, our laws about citizenship and were, were crafted as a result of needing to flesh out legally who's enslavable and who's not, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and so these, you know, this, you know, sexual power and, and racial power is just so fundamental to the founding of the nation. And so I actually, I, I find it more like really powerful to talk very explicitly about those things that you just said. But what, what I do is that, because the thing about, the thing about any sort of culture is that different people experience that culture differently mm -hmm. by, by design. Right. Yeah. And so with, um, so I, I ask students, you know, I tend, I ask them questions and say, well, 
have you ever um have you ever felt compelled to wear wear something or not wear something to a mm. particular event because of how mm. you know you think it might be perceived or mm -hmm. or have you ever thought about yeah. the fact that if something happens to you as a result of walking home by yourself mm -hmm. uh, that you that you'll be blamed for that right and and when I go through these series of questions and then the hands shoot up you know and so then students that opens the door for students to then begin to testify mm -hmm. really and give voice to the the kind of cultural prescriptions that they that they themselves have experienced and that mm -hmm. they find themselves living under mm -hmm. and what often happens is that student other students who might not have that particular experience they tend to not deny the experiences of their other classmates but mm -hmm. they tend to say things to, in class like wow I've never had to think about that, you mm -hmm. know, like yeah. I, I've never, you know, I had a student say, I, you know, I, <laughs> we were talking in class and, and I, and I asked the question, I said, how many of you, when you leave the grocery store, you grab your keys and you have them in your hand before you even step outside mm -hmm. and as you're walking to, and you have your finger on that emergency button. And as you're in, and right. just the hands that went up and, 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 Maybe. What, you know, what, what becomes apparent to everyone is that these often, the answers often fall along gendered lines, uh -huh. that it is often, you know, female, female identifying, you know, students who are the ones yeah. raising their hands. And so, and, and they speak about their experiences with that. And then what ends up happening is that my male students end up expressing, I've never done that. Yeah. You know, and then we, and so then we talk about, well, why do you grab your keys? What's the reason why? Did someone teach you to do that? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we start talking about how, we, again, we live in a culture where, you know, where we, and we identify together that, that, you know, women are, are, are taught in our society that they're vulnerable in different ways. These are things that they have to be on the lookout for these are the sorts of precautions that they need to take to protect themselves from these things because if they don't you know it i mean on one hand they have to you know they they the expectation is that you'll do it to avoid having something bad happen to you but the other side of that is also so that it, you won't be blamed yeah when if when and if said thing happens to you right which is which is also a really a, a real part of the ugliness yeah you know exactly. of, of, of a rape culture that there's that it's about did the victim do everything right mm -hmm. to protect or shield themselves from from an assault which implies that perpetrators have permission you know unless you know yeah, like yeah, it, it yeah, speaks to their yeah. the the permissiveness uh and that then that's what makes it a culture right that some people are given permission to do horrible things and other people are have the burden of mm -hmm. of having to protect themselves yeah. from those things and if they don't yeah. then they're the ones who are responsible for that happening and so Kind of you like know, that, Hamilton's wife or Hammond's wife, right? Right. Like, and 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 so that's you know, that's usually how I I broach those sorts of conversations. And and I'm and I'm and it's powerful because it's not only a it not only helps them to understand the past, but okay. it also helps them to understand that the 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 their the current the the current mm -hmm. you know the the current culture in in which they in which they live in yeah. and 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 i i find it so yeah i i i find myself not shying away from it but i but to you i do take your point that you know there there is a there is a way there 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 are definitely strategies on on how to have these conversations and so but i can attest to the fact 
that it can be done. And it often is really eye-opening and not mm -hmm. only allows students to understand the plight of people in the past, people who were completely different from them, people who had totally different circumstances. But it also, I think I've seen it have the power to generate understanding and empathy for the present and making them recognize the cultural prescriptions that that we have today and mm -hmm. how different people are e experiencing the same street you know the same party mm -hmm. the same That's... you know the 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 same mm -hmm. stroll from the grocery yeah. store to the car completely completely different and and I, and it's a it's a really powerful teaching teaching opportunity no that that sounds like a great way oh i hope people are still listening and <laughs> use it <laughs> um now as a final question the one thing i really kind of was also curious about because like again this is like it, 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 you're talking about the heart of of the plantation enslavement culture in the south the, the sexual violence that goes with it and like i think it's six or seven years ago by this point there was this big news story of this enslaver family and the enslaved family coming together kind of meeting at, at a plantation i think it was in, in north carolina and it's just like this this moment where you're like wait a minute why is this a party? Why is this celebrated? Like, obviously, there was sexual assault here that took place. Why, why are we... Like, I, I get it. Sometimes reconciliation needs to happen, but this is... It felt insane. Like, mm -hmm. even years before your book, years before, like, we had some of these conversations about, um, like, drawing more attention to enslaved people at plantations, but it it just felt insane that the media was all of a sudden jumping on this as like, ooh, this is a good moment. This is reconciliation. And you're like, you're overlooking like every aspect of how plantations operate it. Yeah. You know, I I think, you know, what that, you know, I know the I know the story that um that you're talking about. And, you know, there's there's been so many, there's been lots of instances, uh, you know, across the South of, of, in, of, in, of the, the, the descendants of enslaved, of enslavers and the descendants of enslaved people coming together to, um, number one, I think the biggest thing is acknowledging their, their, shared their heritage uh -huh. sometimes even biological uh -huh. um you know these might be families that have the same last names because uh -huh. many enslaved people were if if given a surname were given the surname of their owner and and after the civil war many of them you know took on the surnames of of their former um of their former enslavers so you know these these projects in in reconciliation were sometimes in an effort to acknowledge that we we come from the same space and the same uh -huh. place and that we have this shared heritage and and experience and 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 shared is a very you know and, and I don't I don't mean to say like shared as in like you know obviously being you know being descendant of an enslaved person and or, or you know being an enslaver and being enslaved is a totally different condition mm -hmm. um but but we we when we think about land and we think about space you know these were the, this was space that was shared that was occupied by both of these um different factions and so i think that there's in those instances, I think that there are a lot of these families, you know, they have different motivations for wanting to for wanting to do this. And I think, um, you know, one of them, you know, as I've read many of these things, much of it is because 
you know, there is, there is talk of, you know, having shared ancestors, mm -hmm. you know, as a result of interracial sex during um, slavery and like, you know, kind of wanting there to be an acknowledgement mm -hmm. of that. Yeah. And I think that for some people, maybe that is a part of like, that is a form of reconciliation, mm -hmm. Maybe even being able to reclaim is uh, is a part of like reconciliation or even reparation, you know, however yeah. um, you want to, you know, you want to think about it. Um, and and so, you know, I, I you know, I never. I, you know, I like to, you know, kind of reserve, you know, judgment on, you know, like why people do particular things because, you know, it might be serving, it might be serving a, a particular need, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? That, right. And, you know, does it address all needs? No. Does it right all wrongs? But like, if, if for them, you know, it's accomplishing, you know, something, um, then, you know, yeah. I say, you know, to each his own. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, but to but to your point about whether these, you know, whether these decisions to have like these, you know, family reunions or these gatherings of descendants of enslaved people and and descendants of enslaved people and descendants of enslavers, like, you know, do these sorts of gatherings ever? you know, is it possible for them to right all wrongs of enslavement? I mean, I don't, I just, I don't, I don't think that they ever, I don't think that they ever could, you know, I think that there is potential. I think there is potential to get to your point. I think that there, there's potential for these, for these gatherings to result in in a to result in a deep dive mm -hmm. of their of their families their each of their families mm -hmm. experiences mm -hmm. and there's a, there's potential and opportunity for there to be moments where people do talk and speak to and give voice to the various traumas that were mm -hmm. inflicted on enslaved people, the various privileges that were afforded to people who owned enslaved people, and even recognizing the the impact of that oppression and that mm -hmm. privilege, even across generations, even mm -hmm. after the yeah. the the abol you know the abolition of slavery, mm -hmm. there's lots of opportunities to you know, to have those sorts of conversations. And so I think that there's, there's a, a world in which, you know, those sorts of gatherings could do some of that work. Uh -huh. yeah. You know, the question is, you know, the question right. is whether or not, you know, <laughs> whether or not, you know, that whether or not that's the work that these sorts of gatherings are doing, you know, that's a completely different, that's a completely different question. And I think, mm -hmm. but I think that there's, I think there's ways, I think we, what we have to understand is that there's, there's a, there's a, there's the possibility that neither, neither side might be interested in having mm -hmm those sorts of conversations. Right. And I think, you know, we have to like, you know, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, have space for that mm -hmm. and have understanding for that. You know, there, there, you know, there's, I hear it all the, you know, as a slavery scholar, you know, I, I hear from mm -hmm. descendants of enslaved people, you mm -hmm. know, uh, a resistance to want to constantly be reminded, mm -hmm. you know, of, Man. the the atrocities mm -hmm. of slavery and, and and wanting to think about the black experience in America not as one that's always you know wrought with violence and exploitation and 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 wanting there to be more emphasis yeah. on the joy and culture and yeah. and and so 
there's, you know, I, so I think, you know, with that in mind, you know, we have to, you know, we have to give people, I think we have to give people space to, right. you know, to, to grapple with this history, grapple with this history and, um, and that, and that's, and I think that as a historian, that would be my, that would be my hope. Uh-huh. I think you know, my biggest hope would be that these gatherings would do, would do a multitude of things that they not, that they would not only bring about perhaps, you know, maybe feelings of reconciliation or reparation, but that they, they, they that, but that they would also be educational, uh-huh. that they would also be opportunities you know, for people to talk about their, their experiences and for there to be, for them to be spaces that generate real empathy, you know, which I think is just so, just so lacking, especially when we talk about America's past, Mm -hmm. there's such a lack of empathy in, in our country for the, the, the consequences of the past and the the continued um the ways in which those consequences still you know wreak havoc there's such a lack of empathy so that would be my you know that would be my hope as a historian that sounds like perfect last words (laughs) um all right but we have been talking for almost i think an hour and a half at this stage so i say we I want to give our listeners a rest at this stage. Again, mm-hmm. if, if you are interested in the book, it is Sexual Violence and American Slavery, The Making of a Rape Culture in the Antebellum South by the University of North Carolina Press. And again, Shannon, it, it was a really interesting book. Um, and thank you so much for taking the time today to talk about it. It's, um, mm-hmm. it's eye-opening. Yeah, well, thank you so much for for number for reading it and and reading it very closely. I can tell from the you know your notes that you sent me and even our conversation today that that you read it really closely and you know and were able to take away a lot from it. And that's the that's the most that I could ask for. And so thank you for this opportunity to share my work. You're welcome. And yes, I did not do the grad student reading. That's for sure. <laughs> It took me a little bit, a bit older, and it took me a little bit longer to read it. But, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, as I said in the, in the course of our conversation, there were so many stomach turning parts in there where you were just like, oh my God, this is terrible. But yeah. it was and terrible. I, and I say very, you know, and I, and I say very explicitly in, in the introduction that this book is not an easy read. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's something that I can't promise. And, yeah. but that it is, that it's a necessary, you know, it's a necessary read. It's a necessary history to tell. And so, you know, I, I do issue that, you know, to mm-hmm. people that I, I, I make no promises of comfortability. Yeah. I make, you know, no prom because this is not a comfortable history. It's not, but it is, it is a, it is a true history and it's, and it's a history that is still relevant today. And so, you know, that's, that, that would be my message um, to anyone who is considering picking up the book. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I do hope that they are able to take away um, a lot from it. And so again, I thank you for the opportunity to um to share this work and i hope that it does get people interested in the book and and picking it up and you know for anyone who does if they have any questions or you know i'm i'm available uh, and would be more than happy to field those that would be wonderful again thank you so much all right thank you take care